If you know the words to the glory be to the Father, glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, why don't we say it together as a way to enter now into the time of the proclamation. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Today we have gathered as a faith community to receive the divine gift of the Eucharist, the meal of thanksgiving. That's what Eucharistos means in Greek, thanksgiving. That's why we share in a prayer called the Great Thanksgiving. Whenever Christians gather around the table of the Lord and share in bread and wine, it is Thanksgiving Day. We don't have to wait for the fourth Thursday of November. When Christians gather together, it is a day of thanksgiving. We call it, too, the Lord's Supper and the Sacrament of Holy Communion. And through the context of this word, this word Eucharistos, Thanksgiving, Holy Communion, Sacrament, Lord's Supper, we can filter through the message, I think the profound message, of Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 to 28. In these verses, Jesus speaks about the cost of discipleship and the importance of taking up our crosses. If you were here last week or if you were in, ch in your church last week, we have some guests with us today and perhaps some guests streaming with us online. We welcome you. We're happy to have you here. Perhaps your pastor preached, as I did last week, about the text just before this one where the confession of St. Peter occurs. Last week's message, from my point of view, that Jesus gave to his disciples was a simple one. Speak up. Speak up for what you believe. And today, the good news is step up. Step up for what you believe and step up to lead. Last Sunday, you may recall, we dove into the account of Peter's confession at Caesarea Philippi that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. This week, we pick up where we left off and we dive again into the immediate aftermath of this profound revelation. Having blessed Peter with the keys to the business, the family business, that is, the keys to the gospel, the keys to the kingdom of heaven, Jesus reveals something entirely unexpected. Jesus has suffering that is coming, and rejection, and death by crucifixion. And then, in his love and concern for Jesus, Peter reacts to this unexpected revelation, and he reacts by admonishing Jesus. And then Jesus responds with a stern admonishment of his own by saying, Get behind me, Satan. You have become a stumbling block to me. You don't consider God's concerns, but merely human concerns. This is a remarkable moment in the relationship between Jesus and Peter. And for the disciples that were watching, it was a tremendous moment for them as well. It was remarkable because, well, this biting, harsh criticism that Jesus levels against Peter might just teach us that while we may understand Jesus' identity as the Messiah, we also must understand and comprehend the full scope of his messianic mission. It isn't just that Jesus became the Messiah so that he could die on a cross to give us life in heaven. There is so much more to it than that. It goes much deeper than that. It cannot be simply that God chose to come among us as one of us simply to die on the cross so that you and I can go to heaven. It has to be more than that. It can't simply be eating Rice Krispies for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, day after day, week after week, year after year. If the only thing about Jesus' sacrifice was you getting to heaven, that's a paltry diet. The fact of the matter is, it is that and more, so much more, that we must comprehend. It is the totality of Jesus' mission as the Messiah, Jesus coming among us, as one of us, 
to bring, yes, the gift of rebirth, but also to endure, to endure suffering and death for speaking up, enduring suffering and death as he did for speaking up and for stepping up to the world's powers that were destroying and demeaning God's people. We, the baptized, have been baptized not only into new life, but we have also been baptized into his death. If you have not read the baptismal covenant lately, and if you were baptized as an infant and therefore may have no recollection of your baptism, I've heard the story of my baptism six weeks after my birth, on the 25th of April, 1960, on the 25th of June, just a few weeks later, off to the Methodist Church of the Redeemer on Cotman Avenue in Philadelphia, held by my maternal grandmother, kicking and screaming the entire way, kicking and screaming during the entire baptism, kicking and screaming coming home, so that my maternal grandmother said, this boy is definitely going to be a preacher. We, I, you, me, the baptized, we are not simply baptized into new life. We are also baptized into Jesus' death so that we may rise with him to new life. That's what the baptismal covenant says. We, the baptized, have been baptized into Christ's death so that we will speak up and step up with Christ through our willingness to embrace the entirety of his mission, even when that mission brings challenges and hardships. That last part, including challenges and hardships and heartaches, that's when people, even baptized people, begin to doubt and they begin to slip quietly away. But this encounter between Jesus and Peter can help us if we stick with it. It's an encounter that's hard to watch in the mind's eye. I have to admit that I actually feel a kind of pain from a spiritual whiplash between what was happening between Jesus and Peter last week and what's happening between Jesus and Peter this week. What happened? Why did it change so quickly? That's the whiplash I feel, and I feel the spiritual pain of what happened in such a powerful moment just moments ago in the story and how the story has simply seems to be going off the rails as we are discussing it now. How quickly the encounter and the conversation between Jesus and Peter changed. Last week when Peter blurted out, you, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God, Jesus responded with what I think of as unrestrained delight in what Peter said in his confession. I am interpreting Jesus' words and making them modern. I imagine Jesus' elation saying this, O oh Peter, you are a fortunate man indeed. The Father in heaven has given you a revelation. God Most High spoke into your mind. The light of eternal mind shared a secret with you. God let you in on the secret of who I am. And now you have the keys, the keys to unlock any and every door between heaven and earth. The barrier between heaven and earth is no more. And when you say yes on earth, it's yes in heaven. And when you say no on earth, it's no in heaven. You are now the leader of this new movement. You are the rock on which I will build my church. You are now the leader of this movement. Imagine standing in Peter's sandals when Jesus spoke to him this way with such passion and elation. And then Matthew says Jesus made it perfectly clear that there were dire implications and consequences for him as Messiah. Jesus reveals that he will suffer at the hands of religious elites. They will kill him. But they were not to lose hope or be afraid because a resurrection was coming on the third day. Before Jesus finished his speech, Peter was triggered. His reaction is swift and it's physical. The Greek word in Matthew's text suggests that Peter took Jesus by the arm and spun him around so that Peter was face to face with Jesus. 
that he spun him around in a not-so-gentle way and more than likely went nose-to-nose -nose with Jesus to keep it private and may have said something like, God forbid it, that can't be. And the next Greek word suggests in the text that Jesus took control of his arm back. He may have wrestled Peter's arm off of him and then said, Peter, for everyone to hear, you're seek, speaking to me like the evil one, and you're blocking my way. You're not thinking God's way now, like you once spoke, like you spoke a moment ago. Your mind is back on other concerns, not God's concerns. There's a lesson here about hearing and listening and responding and reacting and understanding. Now, I, I need you to promise me I don't want any of you to cast a gaze over to my wife over here because she's going to have a little bit of a nutty now when I explain the process of the difference between active and inactive listening. Because my wife believes that while I know the difference very well between active and inactive listening, I do not practice it with any competency whatsoever when I'm sometimes talking with her. So please, up, you're looking over. Now you see, you just see, ah, see that smile? So maybe take your fingers and just put them in here, just, just for a minute. So there's a lesson here. There's a lesson here for me. And maybe even a lesson here for you. Peter did not listen to understand. He listened to respond. Listening to respond is called reactive or selective listening. In reactive listening, the brain primarily focuses on formulating a response. It's preparing, the brain is preparing, it is organizing its thoughts, rather than leaving a little bit of bandwidth to process and understand what the speaker's message is really all about. Selective listening is a very sophisticated and harmful human failure. A speaker's words hit our ears, and the ear mechanism sends the words to the auditory cortex in the brain. Hearing becomes listening. That's when hearing becomes listening. The cortex recognizes speaking and powers the brain to engage in a new process, a thinking process, a cognitive process, to formulate a response. It does so by remembering relevant information from the past, maybe a memory, or it triggers some experience that someone had, some new perspective is coming into the mind now, and the brain begins to plan its response. It's about ready to attack. It doesn't matter what the other person is saying, they're just planning to react, to attack. The brain forms a plan, by deflecting attention away from the speaker's message and putting it onto key words and phrases that have been said by the speaker. Now it becomes selective attention. I mean, this is really bad. It goes from selective listening to selective attention. Selective attention diminishes listening to only what the brain itself, your brain, the listener's brain, considers relevant that the other person is speaking. You are judging what is relevant about what the other person is speaking. Typically, that part of the brain is associated, that is associated with emotional sensitivity gets absolutely shut down by chemicals so that you can make a response. And the large frontal portion of our brain, the most highly active part of our brain, is readying not to hear the input of the speaker, but it is getting ready to interpret what the speaker is saying. And that's when the disaster often happens. That's when communicating goes off the rails. That's when misunderstanding turns into conflict. It reminds me of something that St. Francis of Assisi said. My wife loves St. Francis of Assisi. We went to see his resting place in Assisi together. I'm trying now to distract her from the difference between active and inactive listening and tell you something sweet about her, that she loves St. Francis. So this is why I put this in. But it was something that St. Francis said that I think is helpful. St. Francis once said, preach the gospel, and if necessary, say words. 
I hear it this way. Communicate effectively, and if necessary, use words. Somehow, Peter forgot his active listening skills, as I often do, and gave in to the brain's speed of light ability to seek response rather than understanding. And Jesus effectively jolted Peter back into reality. And this moment is the point where Jesus offers, I think, a lesson in leadership. After confronting Peter, Jesus goes on to say, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. That call to take up the cross is a call to step up and lead, which is what Peter did before he got triggered by what Jesus said. He was the leader of the movement, and now that's in danger. It's a call to deny ourselves willingly and to share and endure suffering, the hardship for the gospel's sake. It's an invitation to follow Jesus, not only in moments of glory, but in moments of suffering and sacrifice. I spend a lot of my time coaching people to be better leaders. I sometimes will coach a person and say, let me tell you three sort of cardinal understandings of leadership. And I do this from a secular point of view. If you want to be a good leader, do these three things. But as a Christian, I hear it completely differently. When Jesus talks to Peter about leadership, he doesn't talk about what we would think of as points of leadership. He says there are three things to do to be a leader. Speak up, step up, and follow me. Because since I came on the scene, says Jesus... I have been in the face of all leaders, and they are very upset with me that I do not understand leadership the way they do. And now that people think I'm John the Baptist and Jeremiah and Elijah, they're going to be angrier than ever. So don't listen to them about what leadership is. Listen to me. Speak up, step up, and follow me. When we think of taking up our cross, of stepping up for Christ, we might from time to time think that that's about the burdens that we are bearing in our lives, that we are bearing up to the tests, to the trials, to the challenges, to the sacrifices that we make for others, and then we let it end there, that we don't have any other suffering to do for anyone else. And I understand that. But Christianity has never taught that kind of faith. Christianity has never taught that your faith is like Teflon or Kevlar. Faith brings no guarantee from suffering. Many Christians suffer every day, and not just for others, they suffer on their own. Many Christians have learned to experience their suffering as a spiritual gift, helping them to value patience and endurance and to accept help. But taking up the cross or stepping up for Christ goes beyond that. It's also surrendering our own will and our own desires to follow God's will wholeheartedly, even when it leads to a difficult path. It means putting God first in our lives and not our own personal agendas. And it may require sacrifice. Jesus' call to step up reminds us of the immeasurable value of the human soul. It was Jesus who said, what good will it be for someone to gain the whole world but forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? Our choices have spiritual consequences. If done at the expense of our relationship with God, pursuing gain and comfort, That becomes an ultimately empty and meaningless endeavor. As we get ready to come here to this table, to the table of Holy Communion, I ask you to come and reflect on some of the profound teachings of Jesus in the text today. And perhaps determine for yourself, it doesn't matter what age you are, it doesn't matter where you come from or how you got here. Are you embracing the mission fully? Are you speaking up and stepping up and following? And remember the infinite value of your soul.
come to the table with your soul and heart and mind open to God's grace and to make a commitment to live as a right and true and good disciple of Jesus Christ, even in the face of life's many, many challenges. Amen.